Good morning. We are today in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. And in my Bible, the title is Parable of Ten Virgins. So, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for, up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. May the Lord bless our time together this morning. Let us, let us pray together. In the early afternoon... December 24th of 2002, this is four years before I moved to Dallas and met my wife, all right? Four years before that. I was at my home in El Paso, enjoying my Christmas break. I was watching TV on the couch when a phone call comes in from a friend who irresponsibly was doing some very, very, very last minute shopping at one of the malls. There's two malls in El Paso and I used to live like a mile from the biggest one, but she decided to go to the one that was 17 miles away from my house. So she says, hey, uh, would you like to join me and then just you know, hang out for a while? So I said, like any gentleman would say, yes, I'm, I'm going. So this is December in El Paso, Texas, and the weather was very cold, it was dry, and it was windy. So this is nothing ordinary for El Paso at this time of the year. But I did not think that I needed to wear any heavy winter clothes because the only time that I was going to be exposed to the elements was from the car to the mall and back. So I just grabbed a light leather jacket and I was on my way to the mall. And then while we were there, my friend receives a phone call from her father and, and he says this, he said, drop whatever you're doing and head home immediately because there is bad weather coming in and I'm afraid that you're not gonna be able to make it home. So he sounded serious enough that we did as he said, and as we're walking out of the mall, we realized that the sunlight is almost out and the wind had picked up significantly. It was already windy, but now it's even more windy. And it had started to rain. So the temperature was also dropping, you can feel it. So we make it to our cars, but unfortunately we did not make it too far out. Our cars got stuck at the bottom of, of a hill on one of the roads that is adjacent to the mall, and we had this situation with black ice where the road was covered with ice, making it impossible for my 99 Red Mustang GT <laughs> to climb the hill. I had to throw it there because I have so many comments about the car, so that's the car that I was driving that day. So we, we were stuck on the bottom of that hill, and the problem was that I had a quarter gas of, you know, tank of gas, and my cell phone battery was drained. At that time, you, just, you didn't have just uh, those chargers for the car. I didn't own one. So my battery is almost empty, no charger. I am wearing a, a shirt like this that I'm wearing, blue jeans, casual shoes, a light leather jacket, and, and, and there's a winter storm coming out, coming in. So I had no hat, no gloves, no coat, no blanket, no flashlight, no nothing completely unprepared. So at that point, I had only two options. I either wait inside my car to see what happens, or I can walk 
two miles up the hill to the one and only Applebee's that was in the west side of El Paso. So those were my options. And this was my very first emergency as an adult. And I was completely unprepared to face it. I did not have enough gas to keep my car running, or the heater for that matter. And I did not have adequate clothes to walk in that weather, and much less you know, uphill. So I never thought, because no one had ever told me, that the weather could change so fast. It never occurred to me that this was a life-threatening situation because I had no warning about it. And as I said, this was the very first time I experienced something like this. No one ever told me any of these things, so I was unprepared. And this is precisely the central theme of our lesson today. It's preparedness. And today, we are going to talk about the monumental importance of being prepared, not for a winter storm, not for a tornado or a catastrophe, but for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once the Lord shows up again, there will be no more time to believe in him. The opportunity to turn to him for salvation will have passed. So, I would like to begin our lesson with, with a little disclosure about the parables, and it's going to help us better understand this, uh, this passage, because obviously their culture is much different than our culture. All right? They did different, they do or did different things than we do today. So the first thing I want to say is that the parables, like this one that we're going to study, they do not always occur according to real life. They, they do not cover all the options. There are going to be some things that are not exactly how they would happen in our normal lives. And that is okay, because the reason, uh, uh, um, the, the point of the parable is not to give exhaustive answers to real life situation. The point of the parables is to make a specific point. It is to teach a particular lesson. So in the case of this parable, as I was saying, the, the lesson is to be prepared for the Lord's return. Now, in the previous chapter of this Gospel of Matthew, the Lord warned his disciples about the importance of being prepared for his return. So he has been telling them, I am going to come back, and you need to be ready. And now here in chapter 25, the Lord is reiterating his previous message to his disciples, and he's now going to, uh, to reiterate this message with three parables. And the first of those is this parable of the ten virgins. Now, since this parable occurs during a Jewish wedding in Israel, it is important that I give you some background of how these ceremonies unfolded, or how we, we think they unfolded. And here I do need to acknowledge that we do not have a lot of information about wedding ceremonies in first uh, century Israel, perhaps because this was so, such common occurrence, something that everybody knew, that no one took the time to record this somewhere for posterity. So the good thing for us, though, is that we do not need to have a comprehensive understanding of how a Jewish wedding unfolded. What is important for us today, here, is to understand the lesson of the parable, and that we know, we do know the lesson, and that's our focus today. So, a Jewish marriage began with the engagement. This was an agreement between the father of the bride and the father of the groom, in which they both, agree, both agreed to, marry, to have their children marry. This was an arranged marriage. And for better or for worse, the bride and the groom had almost no say in the matter. They had to do whatever their father said. So, so that's how this began. And then, at the end of the engagement period, came the betrothal. And I am going to apologize. I'm going to mention this word five times. And this is a hard word for me. So. Just bear with me, this is the betrothal. This was the actual wedding ceremony. It took place at the bride's home, and it would happen on a Wednesday if she was a virgin, or on a Thursday if she was a widow. So it was during this uh, a ceremony that the bride and the groom would exchange vows in the presence of all their family and their friends and, and their guests. So by the end of this betrothal, 
uh, the couple was considered married, even though the bride and the groom were still not living together physically, and they had not physically consummated the marriage, but they were considered married. And in fact, if during this period the husband had died, the bride would have been considered a widow. And unlike today's engagements that can be broken for any reason, at any time, through a text message, at this point in time, this betrothal could only be undone through actual divorce procedures. I was reading the other day about someone's marriage, someone famous, that the Catholic Church uh, um, uh, um, avoided their marriage because it had not been physically uh, consummated. And therefore, for them, there was no marriage, and it's like it never happened. That's not the case here, all right? That, that's what we need to keep in mind. So then this betrothal period could last weeks or months even a year, and during this period of time, the groom was doing what he needed to do in order to become financially stable so that he could provide for his wife and, 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 and family. So then, after these weeks or even months of separation, came the wedding feast. And then uh, uh, if you lived in a small village, the small village would be invited, or if you lived in a small uh, town, then the whole neighborhood was, was invited. And though some of these people, though some of these guests, would be just that, would just be guests, and others would be active participants in the ceremony. And this feast could last up to a week. So, so this was you know, very different than us, of course. Now, this wedding feast, would begin when the bridegroom and his groomsmen went to the bride's house where the bride and the bridesmaids were waiting for them. And at the time, the bridegroom and the whole wedding party would take out on the streets and they would head to the uh, bridegroom's house that would eventually become the married couple's home. So the wedding party would walk through the streets of their small village or their small town and they would have um, this sort of procession. They, they were like in this parade. And the purpose of this procession was not only to get to the bridegroom's home, but it was also to announce to the whole village or the whole town that the wedding feast was, was going to begin soon. And since this procession usually occurred or took place at night, all the members of the wedding party carried either a lamp or a torch that, that um, illumine their path as they were going. I mean, there, there's, no, there's no lights in the houses. This is pitch black in the middle of wherever you were. So they are illumining their path, and they're also calling attention to their procession. So the, the, these, these uh, lamps had a, a very specific purpose. So then at the end of the wedding feast, the best man, not the father of the bride, the best man would take the, the, the bride's hand and put it in the, bride, uh, the bridegroom's hand, and then at that point, the couple was left alone for the very first time so that they could consummate the marriage and begin their life together as a married couple in their new home. That's kind of how this worked, as, long as, as, as far as I understand it. And now with this in mind, now we can begin with our passage. So in verse 1, the Lord Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. This opening phrase in verse 1 has a very clear eschatological orientation. It says, then the kingdom of heaven will be. Jesus here is not speaking about how things were in their present, how things were right there and then. He is talking about his second coming and how the kingdom of heaven will be when he comes back. Jesus is talking about the day and the hour in the future when he will physically return to earth. This that I just described to you is called orthodox eschatology, and it is extremely important that you remember it. So I'm going to say it slowly so that you can make a note of this. Orthodox eschatology refers to the scriptural, apostolic, and universal teaching that one day, in the future, 
Christ will physically return to earth. And he will return to earth to judge and rule over his creation. I want to say it again because it's that important. Orthodox eschatology refers to the scriptural, apostolic, and universal teaching that one day in the future, Christ will physically return to earth in order to judge and rule over his creation. His coming is in the future. He is physically coming back, meaning that if you see him, you can take a photo, you can take a video and have evidence, you can touch him. He is physically coming back in the future. And whether you identify yourself as covenantal or dispensational, something in between, premillennial, amillennial, or postmillennial, all of us in that group believe in the future physical return of Christ, because this is orthodox teaching. And those who do not believe in the literal and future return of Jesus Christ are guilty of heresy. That's why I repeated it twice, because it's that important. So, back in our text, we saw that the Lord begins the parable by comparing the kingdom of heaven with a wedding. And the Lord is specifically referring to the stage in which the wedding party begins their procession to announce that the wedding feast is about to begin. So in this particular wedding, we have 10 young unmarried girls, and each one of them is equipped with a lamp, and they are all waiting for the bridegroom. And their job is to illuminate the path of the wedding party and to call attention to the procession with their lamps. So in verse 2, we see that the 10 girls are divided in two groups. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. Now, in my translation of the New American Standard, it's uh, the Greek adjective phronimos is correctly translated as prudent. However, it can also be translated as thoughtful or wise. So five were foolish and five were wise. They had some wisdom in, her, in them. Well, how so? Well, verses 3 and 4 say, For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent, or the wise, took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, these lamps that are mentioned in verses 1 and 3 are what we would call or know as oil lamps. But they're, they're different than what you are thinking uh, uh, that you would use like in a mine or, you know, in the 1800s. This, this is a different kind of lamp. This, this looks similar to a teapot, a small teapot. And they were made of clay, and they had this hollow body where, where the oil would be contained, and they had this spout where you would insert a wick, and that would be lit uh, uh, on fire to produce light. And some lamps had a, a handle, and some, some didn't, depending on the design. So if you have ever seen this movie, um, Aladdin, where the genie, you, you rub the lamp, and the genie comes out of the lamp, that's the lamp that I'm trying to describe. So as I already mentioned, then the purpose of having this lamp was to illumine the path of the procession and to call attention to the wedding party. And here, at first glance, the 10 girls seem to be ready. All of them were where they needed to be. All of them were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And apparently, they all had what they needed. The problem here is that looks can be deceiving. Because upon closer inspection, we see that not all, not all of them are actually ready. They all had lamps, but only five of them had oil for their lamps. The other five did not. And the problem is obvious. Having a lamp with no oil is the same as having a pen without ink or a bicycle with no wheels. So what I want us to recognize here is that this incident goes beyond just an oversight. This is much more serious than they just forgot, than an innocent mistake. In verse 3, there's this Greek adjective, morai, which is translated in most of our Bibles as foolish. Like in my NASB, it says foolish. 
But this morai adjective can also mean stupid. This is where the word moron comes from. And the reason I am telling you this is because I want you to understand that this word is conveying a certain harshness. It is conveying a gravity. These five girls were foolish, not because they forgot the oil, but because they neglected to bring it. These foolish girls did not have the wisdom to be prepared. They were careless in their preparation. They were negligent. That's the force of the verse here. Then in verses 5 through 7, it says, Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Everyone involved in the wedding knows for a fact that the bridegroom is a man of his word. They know that he is reliable. He promised to return and you can count on him to fulfill his promise. The ten virgins know that his return is imminent. They just don't know exactly the day or the hour when he will come back. But the ten virgins have been waiting for some time now, according to our parable. So it's probably getting late. It's nighttime. And the young girls may be so tired that, that they start to fall asleep. They begin to fall asleep. But then, suddenly and unexpectedly, in the middle of the night, when they are sound asleep, cozied up wherever they were asleep, the bridegroom appears at a distance, and he's approaching the house. So a loud call to meet him reverberates through the house, waking up the ten girls who immediately begin to prepare their lamps to be lit. It's showtime. We need to go. And here is where the difference between these wise girls and foolish girls becomes evident. The issue with the five foolish ones was not that they had fallen asleep. The fact is that we see here that all ten had succumbed to their tiredness. The issue with the five foolish ones was unpreparedness and lack of personal responsibility. That was the issue. The five foolish ones knew that the bridegroom would return, and yet they did not care to prepare in advance for his arrival. They were personally responsible to bring a lamp with sufficient oil to burn in order to be used. And while they did bring the lamps, they failed to bring oil, rendering the lamp useless. This is like going into the darkness with a flashlight and no batteries. They're bringing trash. And without a working lamp, these foolish girls had no place in the procession to the bridegroom's house. When I was in college, I had this classmate that was infamous, infamous for regularly showing up to class with no pen and no paper. In fact, this guy was so irresponsible that he would show up with no scantrons and no blue books during midterms or finals. This is 20 something years ago when we still used cantrons and blue books. So he did not show up with anything that he needed. And what I want you to understand, the reason I'm telling you that this story is that this guy relied on others to provide those things for which he was personally responsible to bring. And for people like this, preparedness is really not a priority. They think that somehow everything is going to work out in the end because someone else will provide for them what they need when they needed it. And this might have been the attitude of the five foolish girls. Perhaps they thought that they could borrow from others. Maybe they thought that they would have the time to make just a quick run to the store right before the bridegroom's uh, 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 arrival. Everything's going to be fine. Let's just, just take a second. But the reason for their own preparedness we don't know it, and as a matter of fact, it's irrelevant. Whatever their assumption might have been, it was very wrong. It was unwise. Tragically, this foolishness would later prove to be catast a catastrophic mistake with eternal consequences for them. 
So, the foolish said to the prudent in verse 8, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered in verse 9, No, there will, be no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. By now, the five foolish girls have realized the gravity of their situation. Probably in a panic or in desperation, they are begging the five wise ones to share some of their oil with them. But the answer is a hard, blunt no. Now, I don't want you to think that this is a heartless or a cruel answer because by no means is that. It is simply the honest truth. Sharing the oil was simply impossible because there was not enough to share. Some commentators have suggested that on special nights like this, the stores or the shops would stay open through the night in case someone had a shopping emergency, like in this case, you know, these girls. And it is also possible that they didn't stay open the whole night, but since it's a village that is small enough and everybody knows everybody, if you had an emergency, you went and knocked on the door of the dealer, get him out of bed, and then he will sell you begrudgingly whatever you needed and you were on your way. But whatever the case might have been, the five foolish girls ran to find a store where they could buy, all the, oil, buy the oil that now they desperately need. And this is now for them a race against time. And while they were going away to make the purchase, verse 10, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. As we can see here, the Lord Jesus did not say anything about what happened when the bridegroom finally entered, to the, uh, uh, entered the house, nor anything about the procession for which the virgin needed their lamps. Instead, the Lord Jesus fast forwards to the part where everyone has entered the bridegroom's house in order to begin the wedding feast. And what we have here is a horrific tragedy for the five foolish girls. The bridegroom and the wedding party have gone in their procession toward his house in order to celebrate the wedding feast. And as soon as the last of the guests has crossed the threshold into the house, the door was shut. This sentence here is of the utmost importance to the whole parable. The fact that the door was shut signifies that the opportunity to enter the feast is irrevocably over. It means that the time to join the festivity has expired. No one else is coming in. Done. We do not know whether the five foolish girls got the oil or not. The Lord Jesus only said that by the time the five foolish ones finally return, the door is already closed. Then in verse 11, we see these foolish girls make a desperate appeal directly to the bridegroom. And they're begging him, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. The five foolish ones then were left outside the house, separated from the bridegroom, alone in the dark. They had no one to blame but themselves. They had been excluded from the wedding feast, not because they were not invited, not because they had not persevered, not because they had fallen asleep, but because they had failed to prepare in advance for the arrival of the bridegroom. They were victims of their own carelessness. They were victims of their own lack of wisdom. And now... They must face the consequences, the eternal consequences of their unpreparedness. The Lord Jesus concludes the parable by reiterating the main idea, by reiterating the central teaching, the application of his parable, saying in verse 13, Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. In other words, be ready at all times, because just like the bridegroom in this parable, I will also return suddenly 
and unexpectedly. Now, that's the parable. And you might be thinking, okay, so how exactly does this apply to us in 2023? Well, this is how. The ten virgins represent every person who claims to be a Christian. This is every person who confesses to have a faith in Christ and love for Christ. This is about all those who profess to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and are waiting for his return. The lamps represent their testimony. It represents their witness. This testimony is that which Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, where the Lord told his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what the lamp represents, a testimony, your life shining the, the, the light of God to those around you. So on the surface, all these professing believers are indistinguishable from one another. They all seem ready. They all have this testimony that they need to participate in the wedding procession. All of them are waiting for the bridegroom, whom they all hold in very high regard because they call him Lord, which is a term that describes a person in high position. So they all respect him. They all, they, they all hold him in, in, in high esteem. But sadly, not all professing believers are the same. That's what the Lord is saying. Some of them are not prepared. Some of them do not have the necessary oil for their lamps to work. Now, this brings us to the point of the oil. What does the oil represent? Well, I think it represents the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to tell you why. Throughout the scriptures, oil consistently represents the Holy Spirit. In several passages of scripture, anointing with oil represents the Spirit of God coming upon an individual and empowering him to perform a task. If you were in Sunday school a couple of weeks ago, when we were looking at uh, 1 Samuel 16, we were talking about how the Holy Spirit had come upon David when he was anointed by Samuel, but he had also come upon Samson and Saul. So that's what the oil represented, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now we said that they were not permanently indwelled, and they were, the, the Spirit was just them for, for a season and then left. Um, but going back to our passage, if we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, we can see how the Holy Spirit and faith go together. So the old may also represent faith, but I think it's still the Holy Spirit. But let me, let me tell you the point. In this passage of Ephesians, Paul tells us that at the moment of faith, at, a, at the moment a person believes in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, he or she is immediately and permanently sealed with the Holy Spirit. Without faith, no one can receive the gift of the Spirit. And without the Spirit, a person will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul says that much in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, when he said, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So for this reason, I believe that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Now, these professing believers described in the parable had a profession of faith, and they have some form of godliness. They, they, were, they were respectable, decent people. They were intellectually, socially, and perhaps even emotionally committed to the bridegroom. So they had religion, they had an appearance of faith, but they had no spiritual life. Their hearts had not been regenerated. They were spiritually dead because they had not been born again. Now, for the eyes of us, they were just like us, but remember, we also mentioned it last time, the Lord sees the heart. The Lord doesn't see what we see in the outside. The Lord looks at the heart. So these false believers belonged to the darkness rather than the light because they were not prepared. They had not truly believed. And again, without faith, no one can receive the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, you will not see the kingdom of God. Now, the bridegroom... The bridegroom represents the Lord Jesus Christ, and the main lesson is to be prepared for his return. And the way to be prepared 
for his return is to be born again. It is to believe in him for salvation. For us humans, it seems as if the Lord is delaying to come back. That's our perception. That's what we might think, might assume. And, and, and it's natural that maybe some of us would think that because it has almost been 2,000 years since he ascended into heaven. And, but Christ promised to come back. He just didn't say when. And that's our problem. In the meantime, believers and unbelievers have remained idle. I mean, have not remained idle. We have moved on with our, not moved on, but we have continued with our activities. So as we go along our business in our daily lives, some people are ready for his return and some others are not. And the question that I want you to consider this morning here is this. Am I ready for the Lord's return? Am I, am I ready to go meet him right now? Like now? Because there are some people that believe that if you repent at the last moment, you're going to be saved. And the problem with that idea, the problem with that teaching, is that it presupposes that your death is going to be announced, that you are going to see it coming at a distance, that you know that, oh, okay, it, 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 my, my end is, is coming at some point. This idea presupposes that you are not going to lose any of your thinking or, or cognitive abilities while the death is approaching you, and that you're going to have all the time in the world to set your affairs in order with the Lord. That's how we tend to think about our death. We think in, in, in this romantic way that you're going to be in your bed and all your family is marching in and you're saying goodbye and, and, and all these things. And that might be so and that may have happened. But what if it doesn't happen to you? What if death comes suddenly? I was reading, there was this woman going south on 75 with a baby that lost her life because she was hit by a, by a, by a, a wheel. That, that came loose from a car that was going the other way. The people in Israel, they went to bed thinking this is going to be just another weekend, and they never woke up. There are people that doesn't woke up, wake up from their sleep. There are people that are struck by, by, by disaster in a second, and they're gone. So what if death comes suddenly? That's a tragic scenario. Or what if the Lord shows up now, quickly, unexpectedly, like he did in verse 6, will you be ready then? That's what we need to be thinking about. In verse 8, the five foolish virgins assumed that they could borrow spiritual life. They thought that salvation could be transferred. And sadly for them, they were wrong, very wrong. Just as physical life is a gift from God that cannot be purchased or cannot be transferred, from one person to another, however, uh, however much you love them. You cannot give health to your sick child. You cannot give health to your sick father, regardless of how much you cherish them and love them. This cannot happen. So just like our physical life cannot be purchased or transferred, neither can our spiritual life. And unfortunately, there are people who assume that they are Christians just because their parents are believers, and they were raised in a Christian home, which is the case of many of us here. These people might think that attending a Christian school and attending church their entire life has saved them. But the reality is that salvation is not a result of our lineage, is not a result of our upbringing or associations or our biblical knowledge. All these things are good and they represent a massive advantage over many other people. But none of these things are salvific. Salvation is not by works. It is not by effort. It is not by perseverance. It is not, by, it is not purchased. It is not transferred. Salvation is a personal act of faith in Jesus Christ. This means that we are not saved through the faith of our parents. We are not saved through the reading of the Bible. We are not saved by attending church. 
We are saved through our own personal faith and trust in Christ. Faith is personal, and it cannot be obtained from anyone else. That night, as I was saying, of 21 years ago, I was able to go safely home thanks to a couple of good Samaritans that towed our cars from the bottom of the hill to the Applebee's parking lot two miles, two miles up. They showed up out of nowhere, and they just said, hey, do you want me to tow you? And I said, yes, please. So they took us up. And my friend and I left our cars in that parking lot and waited for her father to come pick us up and take us back home because her dad had this uh, government uh, 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 job that uh, he could really not describe. This is real. He could not uh, uh, discuss with anyone, and he had anything and everything you can imagine in his car, and he was ready for this. So he went to pick us up. And, 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 and what I want to, to tell you is that this experience taught me a very valuable lesson about winter preparedness. I, I kid you not. That's not going to happen to me again. I am ready for that. However, what we need to recognize is that there are lessons like this one of this parable that we cannot afford to learn by experience. This is one of those lessons that you need to take heed when someone else is warning you about it. You don't want to go through it and then learn the lesson because it's going to be too late. Here, it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is giving us this warning about the consequences of being unprepared for his second coming. He is the one instructing us to be prepared at all times. I am returning. You can count on that. You need to be ready, day or night. Now, you might be thinking, okay, how am I going to be prepared? Well, the way to be prepared is by having faith in Him, by believing in Him, by trusting in Him for your salvation. Unlike my infamous friend in college who always needed to borrow school supplies from other people, you need to know, especially our younger audience here, faith cannot be borrowed. Salvation and spiritual life cannot be borrowed from anyone else. If you want to be ready for the Lord's return, you must individually, personally, believe in Christ to be saved. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30, this Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, he said, Sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? And he responded, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. That's all you need to do to be prepared. Believe in Jesus, and you will be saved. The moment you believe, you will be sealed with the Holy Spirit. He will come and live with you forever, and you will have access to the Father, eternal life, and you will be a, an heir in heaven. Each and every one of us is responsible to have our own personal faith, our own personal relationship with Christ. Only Christ can save. Only Christ can give spiritual life. So the time to prepare for a winter storm is right now, before the temperature and the precipitation starts to fall. We need to prepare right now that it's still warm outside. And the time to prepare for the Lord's return, the time to trust in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, is right now. While you are still alive, while you still have your thinking abilities and faculties, well, the Lord is still away, because if he comes back and you have not believed, the door will be shut, and you, sorry, and you will be cast into the darkness. Your separation from God will be absolute and irrevocable. It will be eternal. You don't want to learn that lesson by experience, so believe in him while you still have the opportunity. Let this be the day of your salvation if you have not been already saved. Well, we're going to conclude with a verse. No, not verse. Uh, hymn. If you would please stand and open your Songs of Praise booklet. We're going to sing um, number seven, Be Thou My Vision. Father, we thank you for this parable that warns us of the importance of being prepared for the return of your Son. 
We ask you, Father, that if there's anyone here who has not yet trusted in him for salvation, someone that is not ready prepared, already prepared to meet him, that you would make this the day of his or her salvation. Above all, Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is through his death and resurrection that we have forgiveness of our sin, reconciliation, and peace with you and eternal life in heaven. And as we go back to our regular activities, we ask you that you would allow us to meditate upon your word constantly, to guide us and protect us. In the name of Christ, amen.